There are a few folks sitting in this room tonight who didn't think we'd ever get to do this talk 2020 in review, and I'm one of them. But there's still three weeks left for 2020, and it may well yet prove to be the year of destiny for us. We'll have to wait and see. It may also be that Yahweh still has a purpose that will take us a little bit further in to the 20s. That will also have to be waited upon to see what his will is in that regard. Well, it has been, as Klaus said, an extraordinary year. Raging bushfires and other natural disasters brought climate change to the fore in international and local forums. They were attended, of course, by other major nat so-called natural disasters around the world. The global COVID-19 pandemic wrecked economies and closed down normal life for almost everyone on Earth. Untimely deaths of African Americans at the hands of law enforcement officers resulted in worldwide calls for change in relation to the peoples uh, of darker skin colour and others. There was a war six weeks or so over a place called Nagorno-Karabakh that erupted and we're going to spend a little bit of time tonight speaking about the importance of that in relation to Bible prophecy. Vladimir Putin consolidated his power in Russia and former enemies of Israel made peace under what's called the Abraham Accord, which we'll also have a look at this evening. And Lebanon, amongst other countries, descended into chaos. That too, we believe, is important in relation to prophecy. But the year ended as it had begun. It was bookended by several significant events that framed its legacy in history. China, the source of the coronavirus, became the focus of criticism from other nations, including Australia, of course, triggering pushback by China. By the end of the year, the relationship between China and Australia, especially in relation to trade, had almost completely broken down. The assassination of powerful Iranians at the beginning and at the end of the year was also another very important phase in fulfilling Bible prophecy. Soleimani, of whom we will speak later, was assassinated by the US on the 3rd of January, and Moshin Fakhrizida, uh, the, the leader of the nuclear program in Iran, was assassinated probably by Israel on the 27th of November. And those two assassinations, beginning and end of 2020, have shaped the future of Middle East diplomacy for many, many years to come. And we'll talk about that a little later on as well. So let's start where the year began in Australia, with disastrous bushfires. The fire season, in fact, had begun in September 2019, and as of the 9th of March, the fires had been an estimated 8.6 million hectares, which is a huge tract of country. The fires destroyed over 5,900 buildings, including 2,779 homes, and killed at least 34 people. It was estimated that between one and two billion animals were killed and some endangered species were brought closer to extinction. At its peak, air quality in eastern coastal cities of Australia dropped to hazardous levels and they say that over 400 people have since died from the effects of that smoke through asthma, respiratory diseases and the like. So this year began disastrously for many on the east coast of this country. It was, they said, a perfect storm of extended drought, extreme temperature and tempestuous winds that resulted in these unprecedented bushfires in Australia. Imagine being in this town as this wall of fire descends down upon you. There's no way you can stop it. All you can do is flee, if you can flee. And there were many, of course, who had to take boats to get away from coastal towns. In 2019 and 20, we had what they call the Black Summer. The fires were visible from the space station and the smoke finally reached Chile and Argentina. And here, of course, is a satellite image of that smoke as it makes its way across the Pacific Ocean towards New Zealand. They said that the snow slopes or the snow uh, in New Zealand on the mountains in the South Island had turned orange through that smoke. 
So you can see the effects of that. Now, this of course brought into focus the what they call climate change. There's no doubt there has been some influence on the climate by man's activities from the beginning of the industrial age. No doubt at all. But of course we also know that the hand of God is at work in these things. So there was utter devastation in the aftermath of those bushfires. It wouldn't have been very nice to be in those areas. But not long afterwards, in America of course, the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis at the hands of heavy-handed police saw an outburst of protests in America and then around the world. Protests quickly became riots in America with looting and arson in many cities right across that country. Protests persisted for many months with demands for complete change in relation to the way that the white community treated the black community in America. And of course it came to us here in Australia as well. In America, demands came for immediate defunding of police. Ridiculous. Yeah, but that's what they did. They, they demanded the defunding of police departments. The revision of history, and of course they went around demolishing statues of people that they thought might have been slave traders or the like. International reverberations persist to this day. And we've still got people in our streets uh, on this matter of black lives matter. But as Klaus said, this year will probably go down in history because of the pandemic. It began with the COVID-19 pandemic spreading across the globe. And fearful of a repeat of the 1918 Spanish flu when in excess of 40 million people perished from that flu. By mid-March, much of the world was in lockdown due to the rapid spread of COVID-19. By December... 67 million cases had been recorded and 1.55 million deaths had been recorded. In some countries, like the United States of America, the virus is out of control. In others, it has been suppressed, as here in Australia. In America, of course, they are now approaching 290,000 deaths from COVID-19. There is someone dying every 30 seconds in America, they say, which, of course, is a plague that we don't understand in this country. The loss of travel, commerce and incomes around the globe beckon a global depression. And why is that important to you and me? Well, you've often heard me talk about this, and I'm going to continue to talk about it, because our Lord Jesus Christ gave us the warning that he would come in a time of general prosperity, he makes that very clear in Luke chapter 17, verses 26 to 30. As it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, what were they doing? Marrying and giving in marriage and buying and selling and building and planting and eating and drinking. Well, there's been a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a clamp on some of those things of late. But as soon as they take off the restrictions, that's what mankind goes back to. And we've seen that in this country. So he would come in a time of general prosperity. So those times of Noah and Lot are a, they're, they're a pattern for what's going to happen to you and me. Of course, what you don't find in Luke 17 is any reference to violence and immorality. Not that they wouldn't exist, because they do. And that is after the pattern of those times. But the Lord wasn't concerned so much about that. He didn't see that as having an impact upon his people. But he did see prosperity as having an impact upon his people. And that's why he warned, remember Lot's wife. And we need to be aware that the events that we've seen in 2020 have killed off this world's economy and that global depression is not very far down the track. Now, it will come when God wants it to come. If that is 2020, well, it'll come before the end of the year. If it's 2021, it'll be that year. And so on. But it cannot, it cannot be very far away because this is clearly a catalyst to bring that about. So we are expecting the return of our Lord Jesus Christ to raise the dead. And then there will be a period when we will be away from here, being prepared for the work that will be before us, brothers and sisters, and Armageddon will come at the end of a time of trouble such as never was. If they think 2020 was a bad year, they've got something coming. Because there will be a time of trouble such as never was once we are removed 
to the judgment seat of Christ. Now I want to talk now about some things that don't necessarily make an appearance in Ezekiel 38, although I believe this one does. China, as the source of the coronavirus, came under pressure from other nations for seemingly failing its obligations to the international community. China aggressively pushed back against nations like Australia, who demanded an inquiry, and threatened strong retaliation, which has come to pass. Tough new security laws in Hong Kong clamped down on, on riots and, and protests and exacerbated international tensions. Fearing further economic retaliation from China, Australia, a few months ago, stepped up its talks with Britain to establish a free trade agreement. Because, of course, Britain hasn't been trading all that much with Australia in the last 30 or 40 years since they joined the Common Market or the EU or EU as it's called today in 1973. China, of course, has punished nations who have challenged its policies. For example, Australia. You would have seen many instances of that when you've read the news reports. So what's that got to do with Bible prophecy? Well, it's got a lot to do with it, as we will have a look later on at Ezekiel 38 and verse 13. And we will see that this had to happen. Australia had to cease having China as its major trading partner so that Britain and the young lions of Britain, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and India, could become major trading partners. And that's what this is forcing Australia and other countries to do. So what does Ezekiel 38 require? Let's just step through those 13 verses, which we do quite frequently in this place. Let's just step through those first 13 verses of Ezekiel 38 and see what it requires and have a look and see what's happened this year in relation to it. Now, we can't cover the whole ground, but we're going to try and cover a few things tonight. And the first thing that it requires in verse 2 is that a dictator called Gog will dominate the entire Eurasian continent, that is, Europe and Asia. And that the territory east and north of Israel will be under Gogian or Russian control, verses 5 and 6. That in verse 6, we read that a dependent Europe will fall under Gog's political control without the need for any conquest. In verse 8, we are told that the West Bank, which of course was supposed to be a Palestinian state, actually will become part of Israel proper. It will not be a Palestinian state. In verses 8 to 11, we know that Israel has to be at peace both internally and with its near neighbours before the Gogian invasion of the land. In verse 12, we are told that Israel will become one of the most prosperous nations, and certainly we know one of the most technologically advanced nations on earth, and they will be envied by others because of it. We also find from verse 13 that Yemen, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states will be the first to oppose the Gogian invasion of the land of Israel because they will be among Israel's closest allies at the time. And we also know from verse 13 that Britain and its young lions will follow suit in objecting to the Gogian invasion of the land. So that's what the first 13 verses tell us has to happen. Well, what's happening? Well, 2020 will go down as an important year in relation to verse 2. Because in January of this year, in his State of the Union speech, Vladimir Putin announced a radical overhaul of the Russian Constitution. And this article from The Economist on the 15th of January was headed, Glued to the Throne how Vladimir Putin is preparing to rule forever. Well, I want to correct them on one point. He will rule until Christ overthrows him. He certainly will not rule forever. The Prime Minister, Dmitry Medvedev, immediately resigned, along with the entire cabinet, and appointed in their place was a, was a henchman, a yes-man of Putin. He is 67 years old, he is healthy and the wealthiest and most powerful man in the world. He fits all the requirements of Go. And he can now rule under the new constitution, which was passed, of course, it's always going to be passed, because the vote's always rigged. He can now rule to 2036. Now, that's telling us something. He displays all the characteristics of Gog outlined in Ezekiel 38, 
And in Habakkuk 2, which also tells us, by the way, how he came to power, he may well prove to be the go. I hope he is, brothers and sisters and young people, because I want to see Christ come, and so do you. The Russian Orthodox Church fully backs Putin and has pushed for him to be made Tsar Vladimir II. His hero is Tsar Vladimir I, who ruled uh, from, uh, from another place where Putin wants to establish his power. And that is, of course, the Ukraine. In June, the Russian Orthodox Patriarch Kirill, whom, of course, was appointed uh, because he was a supporter of Putin, consecrated a cathedral dedicated to the armed forces, built to mark Victory Day in the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II in Europe. And we believe that this has relationship to Joel chapter 3 and verse 9. And this is what it says. Prepare war. If you look up the word prepare in the Hebrew, it means to sanctify war. And sanctify is a word you use in relation to religion. So they've made this memorial, this, built, this cathedral, to sanctify war. Wake up the mighty men, it goes on to say. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. And Putin has spent the last 15 years building up Russian forces, both the military and the navy. And they now have an arsenal which they believe is superior in many ways to the Americans. So it's an interesting time, is it not, as we look at what's happened in Russia in 2020. We also know that Gog is to be the master of Europe and other places who will be part of his confederacy. We have Persia. I'm not going to say too much about Persia or Iran and the surrounding countries tonight. Ethiopia, which we believe is a reference to Sudan, and we'll come to that in a moment, and Libya, with them. So they're part of the confederacy of Gog, and we're going to see what's happening in relation to one or two of those places. We're not going to consider too much about Goma, which we know, of course, is a reference to the nations of Western Europe today. There simply isn't enough time to do that. We want to focus on some of the major things that have happened this year, and this is one of them. Tagama. We read of the house of Tagama, of the North Quarters, and all his bands. So who's that? Well, it's the country's obviously north of Israel, because it said, of the North Quarters. It's a reference to that area of eastern Turkey, Kurdistan and Armenia. And we'll come to that a little later on. And of course, Gog is said to be the master of these people. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that is are, are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Or as the Hebrew word, mishmar, means a guard of a prison. Jesenia says it means a custodian. So he's got iron control over those nations. So what about some of these places? Well, let's take first of all Russia, Turkey, Syria and Libya. See what's happening there. Particularly Russia and Turkey. Russia and Turkey are now on different sides in two Middle East wars. You might recall on the 24th of November 2015, the Turks accidentally shot down a Russian jet bomber over the border with Syria, and which led to a, what you might call a Cold War. There was a closing of the borders with Russia and a standoff between those two nations. So what did the Turks do? Well, Erdogan said, well, I'm a member of NATO. I'm going to get help from America. So the Americans said, yeah, we'll help you. But Putin responded by saying, well, hang on, hang on a second. We'll give you the S-400. This is the, this is the whiz-bang new missile, anti-missile system. We'll give you the S-400 system if you draw back from NATO and the US. So he repaired the relationship. Well, of course, this had automatic effects because the US then said, well, hang on. We can't give you our new S-35 jet fighter if you're going to accept the S-400, which is designed to shoot them down. We're not going to do that. So the Americans withdrew the jet fighter from Turkey. You're going to see they're also going to withdraw the major NATO airbase from Turkey a little later on. So there was a swing in the politics in the Middle East. In late 2019, Turkey reacted to Putin's broken promises on Syria and war beckoned 
Now they've sort of stabilised that a bit, but it's t still very, very tense between Turkey and Russia. This is an article, uh, Turkey on the Wrong Side of History, written on the 8th of September this year. Turkey's expansionism in the eastern Mediterranean and the wider Middle East is coming to an end on all fronts. After a decade of interference in other countries and military operations in Syria, Iraq and Libya, a new regional balance is gradually taking shape, with Turkey's influence slowly but steadily receding. Turkey's maximalist aspirations have become empty rhetoric, said the writer of this article. And he's quite right. Erdogan has put himself offside with almost every other nation in that area. He has continued, as this article said, to act provocatively against the interests of major Mediterranean actors and has alienated every former ally of the past, including Israel, whom, of course, he hates. He's been involved in Libya. Now, when you look at this particular map of Libya, you have some colours here. You've got green on the left-hand side and a reddish-pinky colour on the right-hand side. The green area is the area under the control of an internationally recognised government of Libya called the National Accord, GNA they call them. This pinkish area over here is under the control of what they call the House of Representatives and the LNA, another acronym for an army, commanded by the strongman Khalifa Haftar. Now he's almost worn out the red carpet going to Moscow, this man. He is getting strong financial and military support and troops on the ground from Russia. Turkey is supporting the GNA, these people, you know, the legitimate government. Russia is supporting this guy. He has recently attacked Tripoli, got pushed back, and the Russians came in and saved his skin. That will culminate, ultimately, in a victory by Haftar, or at least his successor, and Russia will have a strong foothold in Libya. That's the first thing we recognise about what's happening in Libya. Now, there's been two civil wars there. First one, 2011, overthrow, of course, of Muammar Gaddafi. Second civil war, 2014, right down to the present time. And Haftar has got the support of the most powerful nation in the Eurasian continent. So what about the future of, of Libya and Sudan? Well, we read about them in Ezekiel 38 and verse 5. Persia, as I said, that's the area from Syria right across to Afghanistan and Pakistan, not just Iran. And Ethiopia, now in the Hebrew the word is Cush. And of course, Cush, there were three Cushes in the word of God. This one refers to the nation south of Egypt. It, of course, is the area of Sudan, uh, and then, of course, portion of what's called modern Ethiopia, and in between that you've got South Sudan and Tigray, where there's a war going on right now. That area is a Kush. Now, things happened in relation to, to Sudan a couple of years ago. The dictator, Bashir, was overthrown. He was a strong ally of Putin. He had, he had given the Russians the right to establish a naval base in the Red Sea on the coast of the Sudan, just to the south of Egypt. But of course, what happened was when Bashir was overthrown, you know, sort of more uh, liberal-minded people came to power and influence, and they've even reached out to Israel in recent months. They wanted to get on the bandwagon of the Abraham Accord. But that has changed. And just this week the Sudan nation agreed that Russia could proceed with the building of their naval base on the coast of Sudan in the Red Sea. Yep, Bible prophecy always comes to pass. So what we've got here, in Ezekiel 38 verse 5, we've got Libya mentioned and we've got Ethiopia or Kush or Sudan mentioned in relation to the Confederacy of Gog. Now I want to move then further north. I want to go direct north of Israel, as it were. Why was renewed warfare over Nagorno-Karabakh significant in September and October of this year? Well, the answer is 
Armenia, which controls the enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh, is the biblical Tagama. We want to have a look at that. In 1922, Armenia was incorporated into the USSR, the old Soviet Republic, as part of the Transcaucasian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. In 1936, Armenia became a separate Soviet Socialist Republic within the USSR. In 1993, Armenian forces defeated the Azerbaijani army in several confrontations which led to Armenian control of this little enclave called Nagorno-Karabakh and the adjacent areas between that enclave and Armenia. Now I'll give you a map so you can see what I'm talking about. This is the enclave. You can see Armenia here. This is the border of Armenia. You can see Azerbaijan is here. This is the enclave, which has been controlled now for something like 30 years by Armenia as a result of their victory over the Azerbaijanis. And they also took control of the region between the enclave and Armenia. So when you look at this map, you see you've got this pinkish colour. That's Armenia of today. There you've got Nagorno-Karabakh, which was Armenian control. And you see these cross these uh, diagonal lines? Well, that's the territory that Armenia also controlled because they had, uh, they had their troops over here in Nagorno-Karabakh and right across to their own border. Well, of course, it blew up again. And it blew up, and what happened was that Armenia was worsted in those battles. The, the Azerbaijanis, who are, by the way, supplied with weapons by Russia, uh, overcame the Armenian army, and so they pushed them out uh, of much of that enclave, and the Russians stepped in, stopped the war and said, enough's enough. And they imposed a peace agreement on those two nations, both of whom they have relations with, stronger with Armenia, by the way, but they imposed peace on them. Now, it's not going to end there because there was a lot of turbulence in Armenia over that imposition of peace. They weren't very happy about losing this territory where many Armenians resided. And so, of course, it's not over. Why is this happening? Why does this all sudden blow up? Well, because you see of Ezekiel 38 and verse 6. Goma, which we know is a reference to Western Europe and all his bands, and the house, notice the language, the house of Tagama. Now, we need to have a bit of exploration of what happened here, but let's just see what the key facts are. Traditionally inhabited by Christian Armenians and Muslim Turks was Nagorno-Karabakh. It's a disputed enclave claimed by Armenia but surrounded on every side by Azerbaijan. In Soviet times it became an autonomous region within the Republic of Azerbaijan. Internationally recognised as part of Azerbaijan but the majority of the population is ethnic Armenian. There's an estimated one million people who were displaced by war between 1988 and 1994 and about 30,000 died in that conflict. And then peace sort of settled on the area. The separatist forces captured some extra territory around the enclave in Azerbaijan and a stalemate largely prevailed since 1994 ceasefire. Turkey, which of course is largely Muslim, openly supports Azerbaijan against Armenia, which is largely Orthodox Christian. Oh, it comes back to religion again. So there's a problem here. Now, why is this important? Well, we're going to see. Russia has a military base in Armenia and a strong relationship with its government. With Russia having a close relationship also with Azerbaijan, Putin became the broker of peace and was in a very strong position to impose his will on that conflict. And he did that. He imposed peace on both nations. But as I said, that's not the end of the story. Something's going to happen there, we don't know exactly what, but something is going to happen that will bring about what the scripture requires. And what it requires is that Armenia get back some of the territory that it lost to the Turks between 1915 and 1922. We'll go into that in a second. So who is this Tagama of Ezekiel 38 verse 6? And why does it say the house of Tagama? Well, because, you see... The Armenians were scattered. They, they almost were obliterated as a nation. And they were scattered through the entire region. They were crushed by Turkey. 
in what is called a genocide today. Between 1915, which you'll know, of course, is a year after the First World War began, so while the rest of the world's distracted and while Australians are on Anzac Beach, the Turks are dealing with the Armenians in the east. And they did that for another four years, to 1922, or thereabouts. So here you've got the scriptural Armenia. Keel and Dalish, commentators on the scripture, say... Tagama is the name of the Armenians who are still called the House of Thorgum or Torkamatsi today. So, important things have happened there this year. Now, here's a map of historic Armenia. You might be able to see these red lines. This is the original Armenia in 1915. There was also a little Armenia. They called it the Cilicia down here, the Cilician Armenia. Those two areas, as you can see, behind those red lines, all except this red area over here, which of course is the modern day Armenia, was seized by the Turks in the genocide between 1915 and 1922. And Armenia lost 80% of their land. You reckon they're happy about that? No, they're not happy about that. And neither is Russia, and neither is the Pope. And they're two important players in this, as we're going to see. Now, this appeared on Russian TV in 2018. You see, this is a map. This is Turkey here. Okay, you see Turkey, there's the Black Sea. That's Armenia, that orange section. And this, is, this was the comment made on Russian television. State-sponsored Vesti said, Western Armenia, that is the area that the, the Turks seized from Armenia in the early 1900s, Western Armenia and Mount Ararat should belong to Russia as well. Now, they were also claiming, of course, this area up here, Constantinople. That's telling you something. It's telling you that Russia has a plan. And the plan is to get that territory back and to give it back to the Armenians on one condition. And the condition is, of course, that Armenia will fully support whatever Russia does in the Middle East. That, that is Ezekiel 38 and verse 6. Happening before our eyes. And the Pope went there in 2016 and he made it very clear what the future would be. He denounced the Armenian genocide during his visit to Yerevan. He called, he called upon the Turks to do something about it and of course he happens to be the leader of the Christian world. These people of Armenia are Orthodox Christians. That's why he was there. And he, of course, wants to see the reversal of what happened way back in the early 1900s. We are watching some astonishing things happen. Now, of course, the rest of the world's attention is on COVID. Who would notice what's happening in Nagorno-Karabakh, except Christadelphians who know their Bible. And we can be very encouraged by that. Now, something else happened that was important this year. Because, you see, Israel was going to assume control of sections of the Jordan Valley and other parts of the West Bank in what they call Area A, which originally was supposed to be under Israeli control, by the way. And we're going to take control of that on the 1st of July. But, of course, the Abraham Accord was coming along. And so they held back. They didn't go in and take control of those areas of the West Bank. We read in Ezekiel 38, verse 8, that the West Bank has to be part of Israel proper at the time of the Gogian invasion on the land. It says in verse 8, After many days thou shalt be visited, talking to Gog, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. Now when you look at the West Bank, it contains 90% of the mountains of Israel, from Beersheba down here in the area of Beersheba and Hebron, right up here to, to Mount Gilboa. There is the, there's the central massif of the land, like a spine that runs through that land, north-south. 90% of the mountains of Israel are in the West Bank, yet they're called here the mountains of Israel. What's that telling us? Well, it's telling us, of course, that the West Bank will be controlled by Israel at the time of Armageddon. And Likud's decision, that is Netanyahu's political party, 
in his absence, by the way, made a decision in the last quarter hour of 2017, the 31st of December that year at 11.45pm, they made a decision as a party to assume control, to annex the entire West Bank. Now, Putin wasn't... Uh, sorry, uh, Netanyahu wasn't a big supporter of that idea at the time, but, of course, he swung right around. Israel is determined to annex parts of the West Bank with US support, said this article, uh, which takes us back uh, to 2019. And they will. There's no doubt about that. As I said, they intended to annex these parts of the West Bank on the 1st of July this year. But they postponed it because the Abraham Accord was hatching. And he, but he's confirmed. He's made it quite clear to his own party and to his nation and to the United States that this is only a matter of time. Israel will finally assume control of the West Bank. Now, I'm not going to take you to the two references that you can see down here, because we've done this before in these talks. Joel chapter 3, verse 4, and Zephaniah 2, verses 4 to 7. If you go and have a look at the context of those two passages, you will find that they are actually about the latter days. They're about the times we live in that lead to the events of Armageddon. In fact, Zechariah, sorry, uh, um, uh, Zephaniah chapter 2 uh, is about the setting up of the kingdom and the bringing of the nations to submission, the Christ rule. But I put it up for one simple reason. When Trump came to office in 2017, after his victory in the election of 2016, one of the first things he did was to set out through his son-in-law Jared Kushner, who is a Jew, to bring change to this long-standing problem of the West Bank. Now, of course, you could say that it hasn't been terribly successful from the US point of view, but it's been magnificently successful for Israel. The plan was the Saudi Arabians dropped their demand that Israel accept the Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital. That's why Israel is now building in East Jerusalem. Like, that's been dropped. Have you heard any complaints from Saudi Arabia about that? No. Complete change from the past. Since, since plan A was dead, plan B is essentially as follows. The state of Palestine would be established in the Gaza Strip plus large tracts of territory to be annexed from northern Sinai. And Egypt had agreed to that outline. Amazing changes. Nations who had spent decades trying to destroy Israel were now letting them get away with what was unthinkable just a decade before. So this is why this is why it's so important for us to recognise the hand of the Almighty in the events that we have seen in the last few years. Now if you go to those two passages, which we don't have time to do, Joel 3 verse 4 and Zephaniah chapter 2 verses 4 to 7, what you will find is mention of the coasts of Palestine. The coasts of Philistia. We get Palestine from Philistine. And the West Bank doesn't have a coast. So if there is to be an entity called Palestine at the time of Armageddon, it will not be in the West Bank. It will be in the Gaza Strip, which does have a coastline. But I want to talk about the Abraham Accord and why that's come about. It came about because of a division in the Muslim world that blew up when Iran, of course, started punching its local neighbours in the nose. They have been, of course, the cause, the aggravation in the Middle East for a long time now. And the division that's always been there between Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims came to the fore. And it came to the fore because, of course, the Iraq war and so on. And you can see from this particular map where you see blue or light blue, you have largely Sunni populations in these Muslim countries. Just north of us, of course, you've got Indonesia down here, and they are all Sunni Muslims. You can see up here that you've got countries like Turkey and down through here, Syria and so on, uh, and certainly Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states are Sunnis. And the green, Iran is almost 100% Shia, Iraq is 60% Shia, and there's an element of Shia in Yemen. That's why the Houthi, of course, uh, 
tried to overthrow it, did overthrow the legitimate government of Yemen, and there's been a war since there, since 2014. So what happened was that when Iran began to flex its muscles, countries like Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states said, we're going to have to find some help. We can't defeat Iran. Where are we going to get help from? Well, why not Israel? Why not Israel, the most technically advanced nation in terms of military power on earth? Why not them? And that's exactly what's happened. It's an amazing thing. So who are these Sheba and Dedan of verse 13 of Ezekiel 38 when it says Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish? Well, Sheba and Dedan is a reference to Yemen, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. So let's take them in turn. You can look at these maps and you can see you've got Yemen down here on the, on the southwestern corner of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. Okay, you look at this map over here and that same area is called the Kingdom of Sheba. And you can go to any place you like and they will tell you, like Wikipedia does here, that modern archaeological studies support the view that the biblical kingdom of Sheba was the ancient Semitic civilization of Saba or Sheba in southern Arabia in Yemen. Okay, so there's no doubt. Sheba, and probably you've got to go across the way here because Sheba also had control of this area over here at one point. So you've got this area which will be a supporter of Israel against the Gogan invasion of the land. Now, of course, the situation is is very difficult in Yemen right now, but it's slowly but surely coming into the favour of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, not the least because of the COVID situation, which has done a lot of damage in Yemen, as has starvation. So there's Yemen, or Sheba. Then you turn to Dedan. Dedan is this area here. And Oman is one of those countries, it's quite a big country actually, uh, on the on the eastern, southeastern section of the Arabian Peninsula. Oman, a long time ago, began to embrace Israel. We can go back to 2018, where Oman publicly called on Middle East countries to accept Israel after Prime Minister Netanyahu had visited there. So even though they had no relationships politically, the process had begun. And, of course, it culminated in September of this year with the so-called Abraham Accord. What a marvellous choice of title that was for this peace agreement between these nations, Israel and, of course, these representatives of the two countries, the UAE, Bahrain, that were there. Israeli media reports that this agreement was brokered by Jared Kushner, Trump's Jewish son-in-law, Mossad chief, Yossi Cohen, who wields quite a bit of power in Israel, and others. But foremost, they said, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, ruler of the UAE, has boldly led the Middle East into what will not just realign the region's geopolitics, but quite likely those of the world, not too far off the mark. As per the agreements, the UAE and Bahrain will establish embassies, exchange ambassadors, cooperate and work together with Israeli forces across a range of sectors, including tourism, trade, healthcare and security. It was called by Netanyahu in one of his speeches, the pivot of history. And prophecy requires Sheba or Yemen and Dedan, Saudi Arabia, Oman and the Gulf states to be supportive allies of Israel at the time of the Gogan invasion. And this is what we read in this article from the Hindu on the 16th of September this year. Netanyahu described the accord as a pivot of history, heralding a new dawn. You have heard from the President that he has already, he means Trump, that he has already lined up more and more countries. This was unimaginable a few years ago, and it was. But with resolve, determination, a fresh look at the way peace is done, this is being achieved, PM Netanyahu said. What an incredible step that was. And it's not going to stop there. Even though Trump will be out of office uh, in six weeks or so, it will not matter. There is no way that you can turn that back. Biden, who I believe has a Jewish heritage, Biden will not be able to turn that back. 
He has said he wants to get back into the Iran nuclear agreement. He's going to have problems with that too. This article here, produced in September this year, uh, reported by the Jerusalem Post, said this about a sermon suggesting that Saudi Arabia is near normalising ties with Israel. Has Saudi Arabia begun preparing its people for normalisation with Israel? Well, they began that a long time ago, by the way, about three or four years ago. A sermon delivered on Friday by Abdul Rahman al Sadaeus, the Imam of the Grand Mosque in Mecca, has been interpreted by some Arabs and Muslims as a prelude to normalisation with Israel. In his sermon, Sudayas said that Islam requires Muslims to respect non-Muslims and treat them well. Well, on the 22nd of November, something significant happened. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Saudi Arabian Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo met in the western Saudi town of Neom on that day, 22nd of November, a Sunday, to discuss progress towards normalisation of relationships. It won't be long. It won't be long and Saudi Arabia will join the UAE and Bahrain in the Abraham Accord. Isn't that marvellous? Sheba and Dedan, allies of Israel at the time of Armageddon, complaining about the Gogian invasion of the land. We're watching it happen. And we need to be aware of just how close we are. So where does that leave Israel's plans for the West Bank? ABC News, August this year. Israel has agreed to halt plans to annex parts of the West Bank claimed by the Palestinians as part of a deal to engage full diplomatic relations with the United Arab Emirates. The announcement makes the UAE the first Gulf Arab state to do so and only the third Arab nation to have active diplomatic ties to Israel. Yep, Netanyahu has made it very plain that the pause is only temporary. Their plans to annex the West Bank have not changed. And we're getting close to the end. It's important, it's important to see just how far things have moved in 2020. There is the threat of the transfer of the NATO airbase, which of course is run by the US, from Turkey to another place. And they're looking for another place, whether it be Crete or Greece or this place. A plan to remove the highly strategic US airbase, said Deb Kefile, uh, 29th of September, highly strategic US airbase from Insulit, Turkey to Crete or Greece, was discussed by US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and talks with the Greek Prime Minister Kyrgios Mitsotakis on that day. However, parallel talks are also in progress between Abu Dhabi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed and the Pentagon on a new home for the US Turkish airbase to territory controlled by the United Arab Emirates, namely the south coast of Yemen including Socotra Island, which the UAE has taken over from Yemen. Wouldn't that be terrific if that US airbase, that's a NATO airbase, was moved from Turkey to Yemen? Then we would really understand, wouldn't we? Ezekiel 38 and verse 13. Well, I want to conclude with just a few things, particularly here about the assassinations that bookended 2020. One article said the head of the octopus had been cut off. And that wasn't flowery language. That was really on the mark. This man whose picture you can see here, General Qasim Soleimani, was head of the Quds, the, the revolutionary guard corps in Iran. He was in control of everything that Iran did in its wars, its, its battles against Israel. He was the second most powerful man in Iran behind the Ayatollah and includes the president. He was the brains behind the use of terrorist organisations like Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthi in Yemen and the pro-Assad militias in Syria and all around the world 
where there were anti-US and anti-Israel nations, this man had his fingers in the pie. He was assassinated. The Americans got rid of him on the 3rd of January this year. And since then, the wheels have fallen off. Not only is Iran cash-strapped because of, of the US sanctions, they don't have the money to distribute to terrorist organisations like they once did. Not only was that cut off, but the leader, this man of 45 years' experience of doing this, was assassinated. But he's not alone, is he? Because Israel is suspected of assassinating this man, the leading Iranian nuclear scientist, Mohsen Fak Razidar. He was assassinated by machine gun fire, evidently from a band of, of uh, agents of Israel, in or near Tehran, on the east side of Tehran, on the 27th of November, just a week or two ago, in an ambush. Now, this man was the, the architect of Iran's nuclear developments. He's gone. He's not the only one that's gone. Israel has killed off quite a number of Iranian scientists who were involved in the nuclear program. Israeli agents are suspected as some US officials have confirmed. The Biden administration will need to carefully consider the consequences of renewing US commitment to the Six Nation nuclear, nuclear deal which Trump withdrew from in 2018. You know, nuclear weapons are not the big problem anymore. Israel is not as fearful of Iran's nuclear potential as they are of Iran's new weapons. 2019 saw an attack by Iran on a Saudi Arabian oil facility. There was basically no response from the US. Why not? Well, because they actually feared the new weapons that Iran had used in that attack. Israel has got more fear of those weapons than they have of the nuclear bomb. It won't be easy for Biden to go back into that agreement with Iran. We don't have to wait and see what God has in store for Iran, but it's not going to get any better. You can be assured of that. This is the catalyst that has brought about the changes in the Middle East. Israel, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states will vigorously oppose any move by the US to rejoin that nuclear deal with Iran. So peace is coming for Israel, just like Ezekiel 38 says it has to be at the time of Armageddon. And the death of Soleimani was an enormous bonus for Israel towards that objective. Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthi in Yemen, Assad's Syrian militias and Hamas in Gaza have had much of their financial and logistical support curtailed. Saudi Arabia, Oman and other Gulf states apart from Qatar are seeking closer ties with Israel because of Iran and its danger to them and are remarkably quiet about what's happening in the West Bank. The US put increased pressure on the Gulf states this year to make peace with Israel and it culminated in the Abraham Accord and that hasn't finished. But what about this country Beirut, uh, this country Lebanon and Beirut to the north of Israel? Well, <clears throat> it's a problem for Israel because this is where the Hezbollah are. They control southern Lebanon. They're deeply involved in the government of Lebanon. But now they've got a problem. You know what the problem is? What happened on the 4th of August 2020? And this is what happened. Huge quantities of explosive material in the port of Lebanon that had been there for yonks exploded. It was a fire. It set off this huge charge. And, of course, there was massive ramifications for the people of Beirut. Over 200 people died. The initial report said 70. It was over 200 people. The government resigned. There was all sorts of troubles in the streets. There had already been riots in the streets because even before that massive explosion in Beirut, Lebanon was a failed country on the verge of total collapse. So these street riots in late 2019 were met with indifference by the government uh, and led to demands for complete change of the entire political system in, in Lebanon. And if that was to come, then Hezbollah, which dominates the government, it would have to be removed. And they're now held responsible for that blast. 
And Netanyahu has warned that more disasters attributable to Hezbollah are forthcoming. And he actually got on television and told the Lebanese people where these things would happen. And he said, if you live in this particular suburb of Beirut, get out. Because there's going to be more explosions like the one you've just had. Why is this happening? Israel has to have peace with all of its neighbours. It cannot have an active... Hezbollah in southern Lebanon threatening its existence that has to be changed and it's now in the process of being changed another very significant thing that happened in 2020 the trend is exactly what prophecy requires and a no deal Brexit seems more likely now than ever British Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced on the 16th of October that the refusal of the European Union to grant the UK a Canadian-style free trade agreement makes it almost certain there will be no agreement reached. And they have been desperately trying to come to some kind of terms. Prime Minister Johnson was on the phone to the leader of the European Union this week. Nothing was achieved. They're in talks. It's going to last another week or so and it'll all be over. It does seem as though there will not be a deal. So Johnson advised his nation that it should prepare for a 1st of January 2021 break with the European Union with no trade deal and look to develop its trading relationships with the rest of the world. He referenced the Australian offer of a free trade agreement as a way forward. And meanwhile, Kanzuk is progressing. So what's Kanzuk? Well, the acronym Kanzuk stands for Canada, Australia... New Zealand and United Kingdom. This was an article in this uh, Brooks Group magazine by a fellow called Christopher Lim who said this. In the aftermath of the British exit from the EU, the concept of Kanzuk, a largely economic alliance between Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom, all of which have the monarchy, the same common law systems and parliamentary democracy, among others. Really? That's Ezekiel 38 and verse 13. This movement is now gathering momentum as the UK nears a a no-deal Brexit. And of course we know that this is what's required by Ezekiel 38 verse 13. We know that Tarshish can be aligned with Britain from history and from prophecy, particularly places like Ezekiel 27 and verse 12. We know that Britain is the Tarshish of this passage here in Ezekiel 38 verse 13. And Brother Thomas, of course, made it very plain in his writings on the subject, this one from the Exposition of Daniel, page 76, that Britain would play no part in the image of Nebuchadnezzar, that it would be entirely separate from it. And, of course, that is what's happening. And so we know that when we look at the language that is used here, Tarshish with all the young lines thereof, that it refers to the old lion who in the First World War called upon its colonies to support it in the First World War against Germany. And those countries are listed on that poster. Australia, Canada, India and New Zealand. And each of those countries, as that article said, have a British system of government and three of those countries share the Queen as titular head of state which is a remarkable thing in this Republican world of 2020, when you think about it, that our flag has got the British flag on it, as has New Zealand. It's a remarkable thing. God has not allowed these countries to sever themselves politically from Britain and to introduce an American-style government because prophecy has to be fulfilled. And... Events in 2020 are forcing all of these nations to rebuild their trading relationship after decades of minimal trade with Britain, to rebuild with the old country. That's why there's problems with China. It's going to force Australian companies to deal with the ones they should be dealing with, according to prophecy. The nations, brothers and sisters and young people, are angry. As Revelation 11 verse 18 says... And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints. We think we might be in that title, saints. And them that fear thy name, small and great, we will be the small, 
and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And there's no doubt that man has corrupted the earth thoroughly, as that word in the Greek means, both in its physical character and its moral character. We are on the verge of great things. But it just seems to go on for so long, doesn't it? Wait for it. Wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not change.